This is Homebrewing DIY, and I'm your host, Coulter Wilson. On today's show, we'll be talking to Jim Spalding at his beer barn. We're going to discuss his extraordinary home brewery that he's constructed and how he has built it around the process he uses to make great traditional styles of beer. Stick around for Jim Spalding on Homebrewing DIY. Welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the show that takes on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Gadgets, contraptions, parts, this show covers it all. Today we're going to be talking to Jim Spaulding at his beer barn, and we're going to talk about Jim's brewing process and some of the great do-it-yourself parts that he's made for his system. Please support the podcast by clicking on the support link in the description or going to anchor.fm forward slash homebrewing DIY forward slash support. Your support keeps this podcast on the air and helps improve the show. Another way to support the show is to leave us a review or rate us on your favorite podcast service. Reviews and ratings help others find this show. I would love to hear your feedback. You can send your feedback to podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. Once again, that's podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. And before we jump into our talk with Jim, I'd like to talk about homebrewing software. During my homebrewing journey, I've had to look for a brewing software that's functional as well as easy to use, and I think I found that with Brewfather. Brewfather is by far the best recipe building software I've found yet. It's all in the cloud, and you can easily share your recipes. Its clean, sleek design makes building your recipes a snap. I've yet to find an ingredient that it doesn't have. It also has fast, responsive support. Brewfather walks you through your brew day step by step so that you can keep impeccable notes on every batch. If you're new to the brewing game or just looking for something better, you need to try Brewfather. And you can support this podcast by clicking on the Brewfather link in the description and you can try it for free. Once again, click on the link in our description and try Brewfather for free today. Now let's hop into our discussion with Jim Spaulding at his beer barn here in lovely Arvada, Colorado. Jim has one of the most amazing home breweries I have ever seen, and most, if not all of it, was personally built by himself. I've stopped by the beer barn, and we talked about his brewing process and how he built his brewery around the quality beers that he makes. So we're here in the Cooper Schmidt Brewery, which is the beer barn with uh, Jim Spaulding. And we're going to talk about all of the crazy DIY projects he's built to build his brewery, which is a lot of things. So we're going to go through each one. And uh, Jim, why don't we talk about, and you also built the barn itself, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially, it's basically a giant tough shed type thing. Okay. And then I just finished it out. Okay, so you built a giant tef- tough shed and then finished it out into like a actual like home. Yeah, it's like a man cave uh, beer barn. I don't know how else to put it. L- let's go through your brewery and talk about the individual parts that you built and what they look like as far as your process goes in making the beers that you make, which are mighty tasty, I might add. Oh, thank you, Colton. I appreciate it. Um, so the the first thing that I always think a brewery should be is attractive yes looks do matter to me but it also needs to be functional and when you want to brew certain styles of beer and for me those are traditional styles then you need certain pieces of equipment so the first thing I would point to would be the mash cooker so I took an old keg um, just because that was the cheapest thing I could find and then actually inserted a stainless steel paddle from the top and I had to con- construct some kind of a wooden uh, platform that would hold it firm because it would be stirring mash as it cooks. Um, so I used a conveyor belt motor, a Baldor motor. So that's what that is. Um, it works great. And, and when you're making a beer with this mash cooker, 
like walk me through the process of brewing and how your mashing looks different than like your standard three vessel system you might like buy from like a, an electric brewing company. Yeah, I think the difference with my mash cooker is it's direct fired. So it's not heated with an electric coil. There's actually a flame under it. Um, other than that, I think it's a pretty standard three vessel system. When you say three vessel, to me, um, or, or maybe it's four vessel that I'm thinking of, but with a mash cooker, you're usually making Germanic beers. So you're making like lagers, box, uh, dunkels, um, alt beers, things like that. Um, but I think the fact that it's direct fired might contribute a little more caramel flavor to the beers, which is something that you typically get from decoction mashing anyway. You get a, a slightly fuller, more malty flavor in the beers. Let's say you were going to make a bock. Mm -hmm. Why don't you walk me through the process of what your mashing looks like and what you're doing? Okay. Normally what I'll do with a, I'm going to say an ale at this point, like let's just say an English ale. I would mash directly into my rest tun. It wouldn't even be in the cooker. But for a bock, I'm going to put all of the grist into the mash cooker first and bring it up to that initial mash temperature, which is usually what we call the acid rest. In fact, usually just mashing in, you can mash into the acid rest. And from there, I would cook the mash up after the mass, acid rest. I would cook the mash to the next uh, rest temperature and then rest it there in the cooker before moving it all into the rest ton. So you're doing a double decoction mash from acid then to the... Protein rest. Protein rest. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're going into the mash ton, which you also built yourself. Yeah, that's my old brew kettle, basically. Um, and then I just insulated it and clad it in oak so it looks good. <laughs> but it's also insul really well insulated, so when I move all of that mash from the protein rest, it sits in there, it doesn't drop. The temperature typically doesn't drop. And from there, I'll, I'll eventually, uh, using like a stainless steel screen uh, colander, I guess you'd call it, I'll move a lot of that really thick mash back over to the cooker and bring it up to the next step and just let that rest at that level, that next temperature plateau, before returning it uh, to the rest ton and mixing it back in and letting it rest again. Okay, so, and for those of you that don't know how a decoction mash works, when you're in the rest, you do take a certain amount and move it out and then heat it back up. So like probably what, close to a third? Yeah, that's a good that's a good measurement. About a third of the mash, um, and then and it's really important to get like a really thick mash that you're cooking too. And then you have to be careful not to scorch it. Okay. So, so there are a few things to watch for. And you don't want to scorch it, but then you get it back up to the temperature you want, put it back into the mash, and you do that a couple of times, anywhere from two to three times as part yep. of the decoction, right? Exactly. And then you mash for obviously your decoction period. So we're talking like a 10 hour brew day? Yeah, at least. And some, some of my brew days for like the Doppelbach can be almost 12 hours. That's a longer brew day than I do. I, I brew in a bag and get four and a half hours. <laughs> well, you can make good beer with that. I, I can make good beer with that. I, 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 he's had my beer. I think he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're good beers. Uh, I'll take that. So then from there, you're going to transfer into your kettle. And your kettle is an SS, you know, Brewing Technologies kettle. Um, and But you use your old kettle from that to actually make your mash tun, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's an old Budweiser keg, I think. <laughs> awesome. And then you, and then you boil for an hour or? Yeah, generally it's an hour and a half total boil time. Um, I usually allow the work to boil for 30 minutes before I put the first addition of hops in. Okay, so you do a 90-minute boil because you're generally doing Germanic beers, so therefore you're looking at like 90-minute, you're doing 90-minute mashes, I'm sorry, 90-minute boils because you have a high percentage of Pilsner, right? You know, actually, I just, I've just always boiled all of my beers for 90 minutes. Um, that's just the way I learned to do it back in the day, and I've never changed. I always let the work boil for 90 minutes before I even put the first edition in. Okay, so for 30 minutes to put the first There's edition. There's no hops for the first 30 minutes. And, and then, then 
60 more minutes from there. Yeah. Okay. And then as far as the as far as the next step goes, you then do a cool down and and what is this cool down contraption you have here? Well, if are we still talking about the bock? Yeah, we're still talking about a bock. So the bock would be drained directly from the kettle into the wort chiller. It's a counterflow chiller. Um, so the wort flows in the opposite direction of the cold water coming in. And it's a convoluted chiller too, so the inner coil also is twisted copper. So it tends to turbulate. Turbulate? Is that a word? <laughs> Let's go with that. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll say turbulate's a word. It turbulates the wort as it flows through, which supposedly chills a little more quickly. And then that goes, so you're, you're, and where does that go directly into? So that actually gets pumped out of the beer barn with a little jump line that crosses the sidewalk out there and attaches to a cellar line that goes down to my beer cellar. You're, you're, you're in a separate building from your, your fermentation cellar. And so right now you actually have your beer going through a counterflow chiller and then pumped into another building basically right behind this building and that's where you're actually doing the fermentation is that right correct uh, the beer cellar is actually below my house um, so it's a hand dug cellar another project another diy project uh, with a drain and everything and the conical fermenters are down there and i can keep really constant temperatures down there i brew with the seasons and so a bock would probably be brewed up sometime in january when the cellar's 50 degrees and you would ferment it in that 50 degrees for how long usually 10 to 12 days um, and by that time it's fermented down about 40 percent and then at that point uh, it's drained directly into a couple of casks and croisoned and then moved uh, to a slightly colder temperature. Out back out here to the beer barn in my lagering chests, which are basically freezers that are fitted with, uh, you know, like a Johnson controller or something like that. Why don't you walk me through what croisoning is for those who don't know? Well, on brew day with the Bach, as we're chilling the beer, we collect 10% of the original wort in the cellar, cap it, and put it in cold storage. And then about 10 days out, we go ahead and brew up a small batch of beer with that original wort. It's green beer, basically, is what it is. And it's really kicking pretty good by the time we dump it into the cask. So when we drain that beer out of the, out of the fermenter on day 12, we go ahead and mix this freshly fermenting uh, green beer back into the beer. Same beer, same yeast. Uh, and then we go ahead and seal the cask and just let the natural carbonation and all the glories of croisoning happen. And then from there, you then lager it for how long? Uh, you know, it can be up upwards of a year, uh, but generally it's more like four to six months. And then once you go from there, it goes into bottles, right? Sometimes, sometimes we'll uh, pressure bottle a bunch and you'll even get a little bit of yeast in there. And so you can con continue to get lagering characteristics from that beer. Other times we just slap it on the, on the tap fridge and just start drinking it. And then uh, why don't you walk me through what you went through for your kind of heated cellar that you have. You, you have a heated cellar, right? That you. Yeah. Uh, that's a, now we're going from Germany to Belgium. Yeah, let's let's go to Belgium. So, <laughs> well, we actually let's just walk through a Belgian beer and what that process looks like. Yeah. And then what kind of uh, uh, projects you did to kind of build that into your brewery, right? L yeah. Let's go through that. Well, the fact that we're into classic styles, right? Well, you got to include Belgium, don't you? Every time. <laughs> So with Belgium, they look at beer a little bit differently. Now, sometimes that mash cooker comes into play. If you're going ahead and using a, a slightly less modified malt, as a lot of Belgian brewers do, they still have mash cookers in their process. So why wouldn't we use that? So sometimes the mash cooker, cooker comes into play. Other times I'll, I'll make a beer just with a straight single infusion mash like you would in English ale. Um, but it's a little bit different because First of all, obviously, you're fermenting much more warm 
temperatures. In fact, with the Saison, it might be, you know, in the 80s, upper 80s, even um, 90s, even for some of those yeasts. But I think the big key with the Belgian beers, whether it's a Trappist beer, a Saison, um, pretty much anything with a cork in it for sure, is I think that secondary fermentation in the bottle uh, needs to happen in a really warm environment. It needs to be a very stable environment. So almost every brewery in Belgium that makes beers like that, they have something called a warm room. So we decided to build our own warm room here, we being me, I guess. <laughs> Nobody else helps me here. My wife doesn't care about this. <laughs> My wife doesn't care either. <laughs> uh, so I built a, a warm room, which holds upwards of about 120 bottles. Um, and I just have them on racks. Uh, it's basically an insulated plywood box. And of course, the doors, I put double plexiglass in them, so it's somewhat insulated. I like to look in and see the beer without opening the doors. Always part of the aspect of what you build is how it looks. I think so. Um, and, and what you can see too, besides how it looks. I wanna be able to see those beers in there, make sure nothing's blown up, I guess. Um, and then of course I've insulated it totally. I have a, a wire rack, like one of those restaurant racks in there. And on top of that, I put a quarter inch um, hardy board, which is a backer board used for tiling. So it's, it's made out of concrete, I think, but it's only about a quarter inch thick. And I cut those to fit each rack. And then below it, I have a gutter heat cable uh, that is sort of zip tied to the um, wire rack just below the concrete board on each shelf. Um, and then that ties into a Johnson controller that clicks on and keeps the, maintains the temperature at 78 degrees. And so that's where you're bottle conditioning all of your, your, that's where you're bottle conditioning all of your Belgian beers. And how long do you bottle condition them for? Uh, all that re-fermentation in the bottle takes place for at least three weeks. Usually it's closer to four. And I always try to lay the, of course you gotta use the champagne type bottles or the Belgian beer bottles. I lay them on their sides um, because that's what they do in Belgium. And, uh, and then I even riddle them during the process. So I'll put a little mark on the top of the wire hood so I can tell what direction the bottle was in. And then I turn it to the three o'clock position, the six o'clock position, the nine o'clock position, and back up to 12. How often between those changes in position? And usually five or six days, um, just to try to keep the yeast in suspension because it's gonna wanna drop out eventually. Um, but when you do that, you get really good carbonation. And when you pull that cork out, you get a nice pop Yes, and I've definitely, we just had one of those beers and it <laughs> tasted quite amazing. Very effervescent. If you, were say, if you were to say, what's the next improvement to your brewery, what would it be? Wow, uh, that's a great question. I, I can't think of anything I want to do next. I feel like I've got the thing dialed in where I want it. I can make German beers. I can make Belgian beers. I feel like I can make, I can make good solid English ales. Um, I think for me, it's not so much an equipment think, thing at this point, it's just continuing to fine tune my recipes and my processes. What, what, if there was anything you needed to fine tune right now, what would it be? In terms of recipe or? In, in terms of any part of your process. Um, I need to find out how to get live pure yeast samples shipped to me in August without them being dead. But that's really nothing I can control, is it? <laughs> it really isn't. Uh, what kind of yeast are you trying to get in August? You know, I'm just trying to get any kind of yeast that I'm needing. For example, recently I placed two orders. I even bought a yeast warranty box. And every time the yeast arrives, it's bathwater warm and they're dead. Definitely not something you want to do. Yeah, I, I guess my next project will be some kind of refrigerated camper truck that I can just drive around and buy yeast. That's it. <laughs> I'll probably convert an Airstream of some kind. I don't know. Well, Jim, thank you for walking us through this amazing brewery. It's something that, you know, only pitchers could actually really tell the story of. 
But I also think that walking through your process kind of really tells the story of why and, yeah. and why you have all of, you know, because for example, I'm a brew in a bag brewer. Mm-hmm. My mash is in a single vessel. And to be honest, I don't think I could ever make a German lager to the same level just because you have this extra piece of equipment, which is this mash cooker. And so for me, it's something where, you know, don't get me wrong. It's definitely not in my future when it comes to my brewery, but it is something where I can really appreciate the beers you make and the work you put into it because, you know, we do taste that quality when we have your beers. And I, and, and I want to thank you for um, really putting that kind of effort because, you know, I get to enjoy them. So that, that is something that I really like. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, uh, thank you very much for, uh, taking the time to walk us through your brewery and the, the projects that you've done, because I, I think when we talk about a lot of the DIY projects, they tend to not really look that pretty. Mm-hmm. And, and it kind of is something where we can go through and say, Hey, this is the level that you can DIY some of your stuff and actually have it really be appealing visually and as well make really great beer. Yeah, that's the key. It's all about the beer. It is all about the beer, and that's why we do all these things. So thanks, Jim, for walking me through your brewery and uh, hope to have you on the show again. Awesome. Thanks, Coulter. Thanks for coming over. Once again, I want to thank Jim for coming on the show and letting me enjoy an afternoon at his brew barn. Remember, if you want to leave feedback or just ask a question, you can always email the show at podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. Once again, that's podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Look for us with the handle at homebrewingdiy. Once again, that's at homebrewingdiy, all one word. Homebrewing DIY now has a website, and you can just hop on over to homebrewingdiy.beer, and I've uploaded some photos of Jim's brewery so you can get a better idea of the amazing equipment he's built. Once again, that web address is homebrewingdiy.beer. Well, that's the end of the show, so thanks for listening today to Homebrewing DIY.